Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Caitlin Elliott and I post and cover true crime cases on Tuesdays and Fridays and occasionally you'll probably see my four-legged son, Riley, pop up every now and then. But So today I want to talk about a case that still can affect society and the, that is the case of the Columbine High School shooting. The shooting actually took place on April 20th of 1999 in Littleton, Colorado at Columbine High School. The two perpetrators were Eric Harris and Dylan Claybold. Eric Harris was born on April 9th of 1981 in Wichita, Kansas, and his father was in the U.S. Air Force, and his, fa and his mother was a homemaker, and his father actually retired from the Air Force in July of 1993, and the family decided to move to Littleton, Colorado after the retirement. So it was then that he started attending Ken Carroll Middle School, and he met Dylan Claybold as well, and the two became like inseparable best friends. Eric's brother, in 1996, he started attending college at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and it's oddly coincidental that his 20th birthday was the day of the 9-11 attacks. So I thought that was weird that Dylan's birthday, his 20th birthday would have been on the 9-11 attacks. Like, is that not just coincidental? Is it weird? I don't know. But anyways, Dylan's parents were actually pacifists. And what that means is that they are opposed to war and guns, which is very consi like interesting considering what their son did. And as many of us would, Dylan, he struggled in his transition from elementary school to middle school and that's it's very typical that this happens I know it happened to myself like it's hard to go from being in one classroom the entire time to having to go to multiple different classrooms so he struggled a lot with that and it's like I said it's very typical that this happens both Dylan and Eric Harris they had these black baseball caps and they used to wear them backwards in the night because it was the 90s and that was very popular back then to wear your caps backwards. Both Dylan and Eric, they had a long criminal history and it even happened back before the 1999 shooting. So in the year of 1996, when Eric Harris was 15, he created a, pe a public website on AOL. If you don't know what AOL means, is it's like this, um, it's kind of like Google, but it was the 90s version of it. I, it was before my time. I, I had to Google it myself. I feel bad, but I actually had to. And on this website, he would talk about the fascination about the first person shooter games called Doom, Doom 2, and Quake. However, that does not mean like anyone who plays violent video games or like any types of these like shooter video games will become a school shooter. It, that's just how he, he was. And Eric, he had a blog on the website and that he created. He discussed about sneaking out to vandalize buildings and even how he legally, illegally, like, lit fireworks. He was, like, like, basically, like, shouting out that he did these crimes, which is very, very bizarre to me. But in 1997, the blog took a really dark turn from posts about Eric and his hatred of society to, like, it, he was just talking about, like, how he hated society instead of, like, his video games. And then he started, like, posting instructions on his blog to how to make a uh, bomb and talk about how to create bombs. So that's a little concerning, a little, little concerning. And that same year of 1997, Eric Harris actually wrote a very concerning, bl like, blog on the post, that, blog post that is quoted saying, All I want to do is kill and injure as many of you as I can. Especially a few people like Brooks Brown, end quote. And obviously his parents, like they saw this, po like Brooks Brown's parents, they saw this post and they quickly called the Jefferson County, Colorado Sheriff's Department to let them know like, hey, this guy is saying that he's going to kill my son, you know? And that was on August 7th of 1997. So this is two years before the Columbine shootings actually happened. So an investigator on that case had requested a search warrant for the Harris property, but it was never put into action by the court of law. So they wanted a search warrant, but it was never like accepted for them to go. And in January of 1998, both Eric and Dylan, they were actually arrested for breaking into a parked van in Littleton, Colorado. 
And inside the van was like multiple tools. And these boys, t uh, they stole the, tool the tools along with several like computer items. And they were sent to court for this because obviously it was breaking and entering and stealing. And they pled guilty and they were both sent to a juvenile diversion program. And then after that, they would attend uh, anger management classes. But because of what the police said was positive behavior, they both got released from the program early. They didn't have to do it anymore. So after this incident, like Eric, he started turning his blog back to talking about uh, the video game Doom. And he started, and then he got these journals. So he started writing in journals all his rage and his hate-filled uh, posts that he made about Brooks Brown. He would write that in this uh, journal. It wasn't just Brooks Brown that he went after. It was several other people. But so he wouldn't, didn't want anyone to know about secret feelings anymore. So as soon as he started this journal, he started like typing up a fictional attack after an unknown massacre. And it's it was stated in his journal that he would try to escape to a foreign country by hijacking an airplane in the Denver airport and um, crashing it into New York City. Which, ironically, had occurred, you know, two years later with the 9-11 terrorist attacks, which I'm not sure if, like, it was related, like, they, the terrorists knew about this or knew about what Eric had said, but it's, it's kind of weird, you know, I mean, it's a little foreshadowing type of thing going on there, it's a little, a little creepy, I thought. And, um, Dylan Claybold, he also kept a journal, and he had kept this journal since March of 1997, just like Eric did. And in the journals, as early as November of 1997, Dylan started talking about wanting to go on a killing spree. And he even went so far as to go into great detail about what he would wear and what type of weapons he would use to kill these people with. So, also Eric Harris, he talked a lot about some really dark, dark sexual fantasies that he had. Including like a sexual desire for women. And it was said that he, would, he loved wanting to, and this is quoted from the journal, torturing and raping women in his bedroom who would be lucky to have him, end quote. And he even went so far as to talk about like even becoming cannibalistic and after he would, you know, like rape these women, he would eat them. And then, yeah, eat them after he had sex with them. It's a little, a little concerning there, you know what I mean? So during school, Dylan and Eric, they would use their schoolwork to express their feelings about, like, foreshadowing this massacre that they were going to do. And they were both in creative writing. Now, that doesn't mean anything about creative writing classes. I was in creative writing classes myself, and I was I never wrote this type of stuff. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not trying to say that anyone who's in these type of classes will write these types of stories. This is literally what they wrote. And he, um... They were both, like I said, they were both in the creative writing high school classes. And they would use their dark fantasies of violence in their writing projects. And in fact, Eric, he wrote a um, disturbing poem. And it was about a school shooting, but it was from the perspective of a bullet, which I will say is kind of, it's very, that's very interesting and unique. But, well, like I said, disturbing and concerning. And... Dylan, he wrote a short story about a man who went on a killing rampage at a high school and his teacher was actually so concerned that the teacher called Dylan's parents and was like, yeah, this is what he wrote. And like, it was really concerning for the teacher, which was a red flag right there. But hey, is it, I guess it is what it is. And... Both boys, they loved researching war and um, just murders, war and murders all the time. And like they were constantly looking up. And in fact, like um, Eric, he had actually written, written, written a paper on the Nazi Germany. And Dylan wrote a paper on Charles Manson. Now, this was for like a history project, I believe. And in his psychology class, Eric, he actually wrote... A paper on a dream that he had in his dream he had gone on a shooting spree with Dylan and it was it's kind of like Dylan and Eric were just basically screaming to everybody hey I have these thoughts in my head I need help you know like there it just the signs were just so obvious why didn't the teachers like say anything 
bias that one time. Like, it's just, it just, it concerns me and it confuses me a little bit. So both Eric and Dylan, they were enrolled in several video production classes and they actually kept five videotapes from the school. And ironically, they had used the school equipment from the video productions class to record these tapes. And unfortunately, only two of the tapes, five tapes, were ever re uh, released to the public. And I believe they are on YouTube. I think I've seen like little clips of it in like a documentary. And the three tapes, they talked about Eric and Dylan's plans to go on, to, on a uh, mass killing spree. And they started talking about how they kill, like hid their weapons from their parents. And unfortunately, like the parents never knew anything, never knew any about anything about this. So that's probably like so concerning, you know, like goodness. And most of the tapes were actually recorded in the basement, which hence they became known as the basement tapes. And the last and final tape was actually recorded 30 minutes before the high school massacre even started. So that's like really weird that they recorded before they uh, started the shooting. I thought that was interesting. Not like interesting like, wow, you know, it's, it's just something that you think about, you know? And they were saying goodbye to their friends and family and they were quote saying, I'm sorry for what we're gonna do, end quote. And it, that's kind of like rings some alarms in people's heads. Like, oh my gosh, you know, like that's, they had all these signs that said that they were going to cause violence and everyone ignored them. So in December of 1999, Time Magazine actually po uh, posted an article in the magazine about the tapes that uh, Eric and Dylan had recorded. And this actually w rightfully upset the victim, uh, the victims family members and they were pissed and they were actually threatening to sue the Jefferson County Police Department for leaking these videotapes and the information so after the after that the article was still obviously published but only selected family members were allowed to see the videos as the public was not allowed to because of fear that people would try to copycat the Columbine shootings and uh, keep it going for themselves so uh, there was a tape called The Hitman for Hire, and it was actually released to the public in Jan uh, February of 2004. And it was, uh, both the boys were dressed up as uh, members of the trench coat mafia, which was a local school clique where they wore trench coats. And it was originally thought that the boys were members, but it was later on said that they weren't. And Eric had left, um... On the Nixon tape, it uh, was made on the day of the mass massacre, and Eric had actually left it on the kitchen table that day. And on the tape, it was set at uh, 2.30 in the morning, less than nine hours now, and people will die because of me. It will be a day that will be remembered forever. End quote. And it's quite haunting that, how, like, how this was on the tape, how this was on the tape because still to this day like Columbine is still talked about it, it's still going to live on forever and it's just very eerie how he said that it was it's just I don't know I found it creepy and just a few months before the attack Eric and Harris and Dylan Clable they actually bought two nine millimeter handguns and two 12 gauge shotguns and Eric had a high point 995 carbine rifle with 13 10 round magazines along with a Savage Springfield 67 H pump action shotgun. And Dylan, he had a 9x19 uh, mm TEC 9 semi-automatic handgun as well. I had to look up all these guns. I had no idea like what they were. But they were able to access these weapons. And mind you, they are like 17, and eight, like 17 years old. And... Then on like no on uh, November twenty second of nineteen ninety eight, Eric and Dylan's friend Robin Anderson, she had actually purchased a rifle with two shotguns for Eric and Dylan. And please, please do not bash Robin in the comment section because obviously she had no idea of what they were going to plan. She thought that she was that they were just going to go out hunting with these guns, but as you know, that's not what happened. But please don't go after her because she had no idea. 
And she was questioned actually by this, about this by the police. And she was automatically like cleared whenever they realized that she had no knowledge of the events and she had no idea what was going on. So along with the knives that they had, both Eric and Dylan, they had um, knives underneath their trench coats. Dylan had a cobra knife that was mounted to his belt and a switchblade that was in his right pocket. And Eric had a boot knife that was strapped to his belt and a machete bowie knife taped to his ankle and had a SWAT stick engraved in the, um, the sheath, which is also really concerning. Because like I said, they were obsessed with Nazis and it had a SWAT stick on it. Like, come on now, rings, some bells must have been ringing in someone's head when they saw, like, realized what was you know, like putting two two together, but oh my goodness. And then on top of all their weapons that they had made, Dylan and Eric, they had constructed a total of 99 bombs. That's a lot of bombs. Not only did they have the 99 bombs, which at first I thought they made 99 bombs because maybe it was because it was the year of 1999. Maybe that's why they made it. But because remember, they want to live like an in infamy and all that, but have uh, a massacre that nobody would ever forget. So it, it kind of makes sense, but I just want to know what you guys' theories and thoughts are on that down below in the comment section. And they had made pipe bombs, carbon dioxide cartridges that were filled with gunpowder called crickets, Molotov cocktails and propane tanks that were converted into bombs. And Eric, he had also wanted to use napalm and a backpack flamethrower. So they had like this mutual friend, his name was Chris Morris, and he asked Chris Morris to keep all these items over at his house. And obviously Chris Morris, he refused. And so then Eric, he just, he would just decide that he was gonna ask Chris Morris, hey, do you want to become the third shooter in our little plan that we have? You know, and obviously Chris was freaked out. He was like, what the fuck? What are you talking about? But Eric, he just laughed it off as a joke. And he acted like he had no, like, he was just kidding. Like, haha, just kidding, you know? And so along with all these weapons, like, the two had made, the two had made pipe bombs. And they even listed the instructions on their website of how to make these pipe bombs. Again, another red flag. In this journal, in his journal, he, it was stated that Eric had built over 25 different pipe bombs and Dylan had actually brought a pipe a pipe bomb into his job as well at one point, which that alone should have just raised some red flags. Like, he, he, I think he worked at a pizza place and he brought in a bomb. Like, that's a little concerning. In the cafeteria, Eric and Dylan, he, they actually transformed eight propane tanks into bombs before placing them all over the cafeteria with timers on them to explode. Now, they also had uh, made two car bombs out of propane tanks and pipe bombs, and eight pipe bombs were put in Dylan's car along with Eric's car. They put eight in each. And so the two had actually planned to have the bombs go off in the commons, like during lunchtime, where there was going to be a lot of people there. And how, like, and whatever, like, Whenever um, it wouldn't kill all these people, he, they would just start shooting and kill all the um, su remaining survivors. And so the two had made their way back to the car to change and return back into the high school, with their targets mainly being the cafeteria and the library. So as Eric Harris arrived to Columbine, he actually ran to a really popular guy named Brooks Brown, and they had recently like patched up their differences, so they were kind of friends at this point and Eric told Brooks he was like look you need to go because he asked Brooks asked him he's like hey what are you guys doing you know and Eric told Brooks he's like listen man I like you now you need to go home please and Brooks he actually left and did go home because what Eric was doing and the way he was acting made him extremely uncomfortable so both Dylan and Eric, they started arming themselves up with the um, pipe bombs and the ammunition in their bags. And however, their plan started going haywire when the bombs, the homemade bombs didn't go off as planned. If the bombs would have gone off as they planned, over 500 kids would have been killed. 
And then once it hit 11, 19 a.m., there was a young girl named Rachel Scott, and she was 17 years old, and she was having lunch with her friend uh, Richard Costaldo. And Dylan threw a pipe bomb in their direction, and it started to smoke. And this caused a lot of confusion and laughter because, you know, it's getting towards the end of the year. They're seniors. You know, they probably thought they thought it was a senior prank. And, you know, I will tell you right now, it's very common. That's when I was in high school, they had a whole bunch of senior pranks my senior year. So I can understand where they're coming from. And at that time, that's when Dylan and Eric, they started to pull out their guns and they opened fire. And they hit Rachel Scott with a shot to the temple and killed her instantly. And Richard Costaldo was paralyzed because he was shot eight times. Eric then, he aimed his gun up at the staircase and he fired and he killed 15 year old Dylan, Daniel Rohrbar. I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing this name wrong. Is it Rohrbar? Rohrbar? And he gravely injured uh, Sean Graves and Lance Kirkland. Around this time, a teacher, his name was uh, William David's, David Sanders, and he was known as Dave Sanders, Mr. Sanders. And he started hearing gunshots, and so he started just frantically warning students to please get out, get cover. And while uh, they were still outside, Dylan and Eric, they started shooting up towards a bunch of students who were sitting outside. And he shot. they shot two. Not fatally, but they did shoot two, and three got away, actually unharmed. And it was at this time that Lance started calling for help weekly. Uh, the shooters started walking past him. And it said that Dylan said, sure, dude, I'll help you. And he shot Lance in the face. And thank, thank God that Lance actually survived this. Thank God for that. And Dylan, he walked over to Sean, Sean Graves, who had been injured while well, like, he walked over him, and he was like, oh, sorry, dude, like, exactly like that. And the fact that he was acting, li like, Dylan was acting like nothing was going on, like, he just walked over and like, whoops, sorry, dude. And that's literally quoted what he said, and how he said it. It's just so scary, and it's just absolutely creepy. It gave me chills when I read that. I was like, oh my god. So, Eric, he's now at the top of the steps, and he starts firing his uh, gun down at anyone he sees walking around. And he shoots uh, Anne-Marie Hawkhalder, who luckily survives, but she's left paralyzed for the rest of her life and wounded badly. Dylan and Eric, they start making their way towards the soccer field where a bunch of students were practicing soccer. And they start shooting at them, but luckily nobody was injured or killed. A witness was over by the soccer field, and they heard them say, Man, this is what I've always wanted to do. This is awesome. End quote. The teacher, uh, there was a teacher who was inside. Her name was Patty Nelson. And she started to walk outside thinking this is some kind of stupid senior prank. She's like, oh my gosh, you guys need to stop what you're doing. And you guys need to stop acting like this. And as she started, as she was doing this, she ended up getting shot. Uh, uh, she was getting shot at, but she was hit with the shrapnel. So she wasn't shot like through the body, but she was hit with the shra shrapnel. That's when she realized that this, in fact, was a very real scary situation. And she had quickly run into the library and told everyone to get under the tables as she called 911. Now the 911 call is actually, I believe, on YouTube, so please check that out and listen to it. It's very, it's horrifying to listen to, but it's very important when it comes to this case. Around 11.22, there was actually a janitor outside in the senior parking lot, and he was cleaning up, and he starts hearing these noises. So he called the resource officer to come to where he was, and at the same time, there was a call that there was a female down, which I'm assuming they were talking about Rachel. And the resource officer assumed that this girl had been hit by a car, and that's when he gets told, Neil, no, there's a shooter in the school, end quote. And that's when Eric Harris, he turns towards the resource, resource officer, and his name was Officer Gardner, and he starts shooting at him ten times. Ten rapid shots is what it said. And Officer Gardner, he starts retaliating it by pulling out a gun and start firing back at Eric. But Eric had ducked behind a building, and Officer Gardner is quoted as saying that shots in the building, I need someone in the lot with me. It is said that at this time, Eric Harris had shot his gun 47 times, while Dylan had only shot five. 
and the sixth time was when he shot Stephanie Munson in the ankle. There were two deputies nearby the school who heard the female down call from Officer Gardner and they and started to make their way towards Columbine High School, which wasn't too far from where they were. The six deputies they had that had arrived, they started trying to rescue as many students as they could, just as a second gunfight started going off. And luckily, nobody was hit. One of the teachers, his name was Dave Saunders, he told all of his students to get down underneath the tables and into classrooms as he led them up the stairs. And that was when he was shot twice in the back and once in the neck. And the students near him were left unharmed. So Dave, he managed to make his way to the science classroom before he collapsed. And a student named Aaron Harkey, he actually provided... Um, first aid to him. And Patty Nelson, who was in the library at the time, she called the police right away. And around 11.30 in the morning, Eric and Dylan entered the library where there was 52 students, two teachers, and two librarians. Now the library part is where the most amount of deaths occurred. And Eric fired his weapon towards a student, and the student ducked and was only hit by wood splinters, thank God. That's when the two made their way towards the computers, and there was a 16-year-old student named Kyle Velasquez, and he was sitting at the computer. Now, Kyle, he, um, bless his heart, he was mentally disabled, so he didn't understand fully what was going on. And so, Eric shot him in the head, and it killed him instantly. Nearby was a 14-year-old Stephen Kernow, and he was hiding behind a desk, and Eric shot him fatally in the neck. Then he shot 17-year-old Casey Rugsager in the shoulder and she had severed a major artery whenever the uh, shot had happened. So as she's screaming in pain, it's said that Eric Harris yelled at her, quoted, quit your bitching. And that's when he noticed Cassie Bernal and the two of them had a little peekaboo game, you know, like she was ducking and he was trying to find her and ducking and, you know, and eventually he ended up seeing her, like she got exposed too much and he shot her in the head and killed her. And it was at this time that the gun recoiled back and hit Eric right in the face and it caused a bloody nose. And he told Dylan this, that he had shot her and it recoiled back and he had a bloody nose and Dylan turned to him and said, why would you do that? Quoted, why would you do that? At the same time, there was a girl named Brie Pascal, and she was sitting next to the uh, the table that um, Cassie was shot at. And so Eric, he had just blood just pouring from his nose. And so he asks Brie, he was she, he was like, "Do you want to live or do you want to die?" And she's obviously begging and pleading for her life to be spared. And Eric was saying. He laughed and he said, doesn't matter, everyone's going to die. Because remember, they had the bombs and they expected the bombs to blow up, go off and kill everybody inside the school. So, Dylan, he elbows Eric and goes, just kill her already. And um, Eric, he decides against it, saying that they were just going to blow everyone up anyway. So, I might as well just not shoot her. So, that's it was around this time that Dylan walks over to another table and he points out to Eric that he sees, quoted, I see a racial slur for an African-American male underneath the table over there. And I didn't want to say that word because I find it a very hateful and offensive word, but that is what he had said. And Dylan tried to pull him out from underneath the table and Eric starts shooting underneath. And so he shoots Isaiah Scholes in the chest and kills him. Though he wasn't shot in the head, Dylan was quoted saying, Damn, I didn't know brains could fly back, fly that far back. That's some disturbing shit, dude. Like, that's so disturbing. I can only imagine how terrified these poor students were. And these poor people that ended up getting killed. Oh my god. So Eric led him and Dylan to another table where he shot and injured Nicole Nolan and John Tomlin. Now John Tomlin, he tried so hard to get out from underneath the table and escape, but Dylan opened, fired, opened fire on John and killed him. They then moved on to 18-year-old Lauren Townsend 
and 16 year old named Kel uh, 16 year old named Kelly Fleming and they were both hiding underneath a table and Uh, Dylan, uh, like I said, uh, Kelly was underneath the table, and when asked who was under there, a voice had said, John Savage, what are you guys doing? You know, because John Savage was underneath the table with the two girls. And so, he asked, what are you guys doing? And they just said, killing people was their haunting response. And John asked if they were going to go kill him, and Dylan said, no, just get out of here, man. And so John did. And after he left, Eric Harris opened fire and where he was and hit Daniel Moser, who was 15, he winced in pain. And that's when Eric shot Daniel in the face at close range. And he ended up shooting the very last victim of the, sh the massacre at 11.35 a.m. And just the library alone, there was 10 dead and 12 injured. I apologize for like the past like pause. I had like a total like brain fart like I didn't couldn't figure out where I was reading from so I do apologize for that so just before 12 noon the two of them uh Eric and Dylan they had left the library and went to the chemistry lab and they started a few fires there and then they just left for the they left the cafeteria around 11 56 a.m and they both decided to go back to the library and they started shooting down at police officers until a little after 12 o'clock noon. Then just six minutes later, at 12.08 p.m., both Dylan and Eric committed suicide in the library. And like I said, by noon, there was a SWAT team that was surrounding the entire school because they thought that they were going to have to go inside and get the shooters out, but they had committed suicide. So, there were several ambulances that started taking the wounded to the hospitals, but unfortunately, the beloved teacher had died waiting for help. He bled out. The Columbine shooting at that time had just become the deadliest school shooting in American history. And by April 21st, 15 people were dead. Now, I want to spend some time talking a little bit about each individual victim and some very special facts about each of them. I will not be speaking about Eric Harris or Dylan Klebold, just the ones that they killed. Now, pl so please keep the, res the comments respectful, please. And the first person I want to talk about today is Kyle Velasquez. And Kyle, he was born on May 5th of 1982 and he actually was killed 15 days before his birthday and was the fourth person killed, but the first one killed in the library. He recently had moved to Littleton, Colorado, and had only been attending Columbine High School for three months. His friends claimed that he was always happy and smiling, and the most heartbreaking part about his death was that he had actually suffered a stroke as an infant, and it left him mentally disabled. And the second person I want to talk about today is Rachel Scott. Rachel Scott, she seemed like a very... I need to take some deep breaths because I'm trying not to cry because I don't want to get emotional, but... Rachel Scott, she was a beautiful soul, and anyone who knew her seemed lucky enough to know her. And even through all that, she had self-esteem issues and didn't think she was good enough. And her family is quoted saying that she was blind to her own beauty. Rachel was a very godly person. She was very religious, along with being a very friendly girl. And if someone considered another person to be a loser, you know, like what they did in high school, always calling people losers or terrible terrible words for other people she would go over and sit with them at lunch and invite them to be her friend and as we all know high schoolers they have lots of parties you know with alcohol and marijuana but she had made a promise to herself that no matter what she would never drink alcohol and do drugs rachel was also a big believer of remaining pure and when she had her first serious relationship Rachel had actually ended it because she was worried that it would lead to sex. And in the month of uh, March in 1993, Rachel was 11 when she decided that she was going to devote her life to God. And it was said by her peers that Rachel had a very colorful, colorful personality. And she often wore eccentric hats 
and pajamas. Ever since she was a young girl, she wanted to be an actress. And she even performed a mime act to the song Watch the Lamb for the talent show. And the tape for the song actually jammed halfway through. And surprisingly, Dylan Claybold was the one who ran to her rescue and fixed it for her so she could continue her performance. And it is said after the, uh, her performance, she went and she thanked him and said that she was grateful for what he had done. Now the third person I want to talk about is Daniel Rohrbaugh. Roar, Roar ball, sorry, I'm, I'm terrible with names. So he was 15 years old and he absolutely loved electronics and computer games. And he was constantly wanting to be in the library to work on the computer. He was 15, like I said, and he was so excited about getting his driver's permit. Because, you know, like once you hit 15, you can get your driver's permit. And because of Daniel's love of electronics, he enjoyed working at his father's studio business. Stereo business, sorry. And would be there, like, would help there almost every day. So on April 20th, 1999, Daniel's father, Brian, knew that there was something wrong when he didn't show up at the stereo business like he normally does after school. And it turns out that Daniel was leaving the commons with two of his friends, Lance Kirkland and Sean Graves, when he was sh hit by shots in his stomach and his left leg. His friend Lance Kirkland tried to catch him, but he was shot in the face. Poor Danny was left there bleeding for two days until he bled to death. God bless his heart. Oh my God. The next victim I want to talk about will be Coach Dave Sanders. And his full name was William David Sanders. And he was 47 years old at the time of the massacre. Even though he was a coach, he was also a computer and business teacher for 25 years. Al along with being the girls softball coach. And once the shooting had started, he had run into the commons and he had pulled the fire alarm, hoping an ambulance or a fire truck would come. Dave Sanders managed to save a hundred lives that day by herding them upstairs and getting them safely into other classrooms or out of the school. Just as he was turning to help more people, he was actually shot three times and he bled to death after waiting three hours for help. The youngest victim of the massacre was 14-year-old Stephen Kernow. He was a member of the soccer team and he loved soccer and he was only a freshman. He was only 14 years old. He had dreams of being a Navy top uh, gun pilot and um, he even what he was very close to his parents and he was even a soccer referee for his father's team that he was a coach of and his favorite color was actually said to be green because it was the color of a soccer field. Like most kids, uh, Steven, he loves Star Wars movies and had watched the movies so many times that he was able to recite the dialogue, which is really impressive. And Steven, he was in the library when the shooting began. And he was uh, hiding under... And he was uh, hiding under a table. And unfortunately, he was shot in the neck. And he died instantly. And he was the youngest victim of the massacre. And the next uh, victim I want to talk about today is John Tomlin. John wasn't too familiar with the Colorado area as he was a, a native of Wisconsin and he loved God and he was a member of his church youth group where he met Michelle Oweather and they had been dating for seven months prior to the massacre. He was 16 years old and had just gotten his driver's license along with a brand new truck that he had just driven to Mexico to help build a house for a poor family, possibly through his church. I wasn't sure if it was through his church or not, but um... Both his car and Rachel's car ended up becoming a temporary memorial for students to place notes and flowers upon. And it said that he was, while he was in the library, he hid under a table with a girl he didn't know named Nicole Noden. And he held her hand and told her everything was going to be okay before Eric shot both of them and then Dylan came by and killed John. I'm not going to speak about Dylan Mouser who was only 15 years old. It was stated by his father that he was a very smart kid and he was very good at science and math. In fact, on his last report card, he had gotten straight A's, which is incredible. I've never gotten straight A's before in my life, so that's amazing. And his father also stated that Daniel, he wasn't afraid of any challenges that came his way or he wasn't even ashamed to be seen hugging his parents, which as a teenager, it's common to be embarrassed or ashamed to hug, kiss, or tell your parents that you love them. But Daniel, he wasn't like that. He was a very loving kid. 
And it was said that Daniel actually went to the same middle school as both Dylan and Eric, but it wasn't known to the public whether or not he actually knew Dylan and Eric before the shooting. D uh, Daniel, he was a very confident kid, and he wasn't afraid to face challenges head-on, like I explained earlier. But he decided to join the debate team, which is not something he did have a lot of experience in. And he was said to not be very athletic, but he joined his uh, school's cross-country team. And Daniel, he absolutely loved to ski. He was actually fascinated by it. And he was part of an extracurricular French club at his school. So he was very involved in Columbine's extracurricular activities. He was, like I mentioned before, he was good at science. And after his death, it was announced that he was the top biology student at the school and had been accepted into the National Honor Society as an honorary member. So Daniel was described as a kind and gentle soul and he was very close with his sister Christine. I can only imagine how difficult his death was on his sister and I seriously hope she's doing well. Like bless her and his family. I really hope everyone's families are doing well right now. And ironically Daniel was extremely concerned about gun safety and I'm saying it's ironic because of what happened to him in the shooting and everything. So two weeks before the shooting, Daniel, he actually asked his dad, Tom, about whether or not he knew about the loopholes in the Brady Bill. Now, the Brady Bill is an act of law that was made to provide a waiting period for the purchase of a handgun and for the establishment of a national instant criminal background check to be contacted by the firearms dealer before the transfer of any firearm. After the shooting, Tom, he became an active protester of the NRA and campaigning he started campaigning for uh, stricter gun laws. So let's now talk about the uh, next victim. Her name is Cassie Bernal. And there's so much controversy about what was really said and what happened before she died. But I want to talk about how beautiful she truly was inside and out. Just like Rachel Scott. And she became a born-again Christian two years prior in 1997. She was very active in her church youth groups and Bible study groups through her church. And when uh, Cassie wasn't devoting her life to the Lord... She loved going to Breckenridge and rock climbing as well, which is really impressive. Rock climbing, that's so cool. Cassie, she also loved to travel. In fact, before the, uh, the shooting, she had recently gone to Great Britain, which is England for people who don't know. And her favorite movie at the time was Braveheart, which is a Mel Gibson movie that came out in uh, 1995. Braveheart is a movie that takes place in medieval Scotland. And it's about a man who helps a revolt against the English after Mel Gibson's character, his lover, was killed. It was a very, it's a very good movie. I highly recommend watching that. It's so good. So Cassie Bernal's name became famous after the shooting because it was thought that she was the girl from the library, which the girl from the library was well known because one of the shooters, it was unknown which one, had asked a girl, do you believe in God? And it is said that she had replied with yes before she was being before she was fatally shot in the head. However, it's also said that she was also the peekaboo girl, and the peekaboo peek girl got that name because she kept ducking her head and hiding from Eric and Dylan before Eric bent down saying peekaboo and shot her in the head. So after Cassie's death, her mother Misty wrote a book entitled "She Said Yes: The Unlikely Martyrdom." of Cassie Bernal and ended up becoming a bestseller and Misty went on to appear on the Oprah show in 1999 talking talking about how uh, Cassie's death became a martyr for Christianity. I'm now going to be speaking about the death of Corey DePuter and Corey he seemed like a all-American young man who loves sport like he loves sports. He was actually a former wrestler but it's unclear of why he quit but along with wrestling, it's said that he loved hunting, golfing, fishing. And it's said by his family that he loved fishing the most. And it was his real passion in life was to be uh, fishing. And it's said because like he loved fishing so much, he even took up a maintenance job to help raise money for a fishing boat that he wanted. His parents quoted saying that Corey loved school and he always put his schoolwork above anything else. And even going so far as to be disappointed whenever he got his wisdom teeth surgery and have it, had to miss school. At the time of the shooting, Corey was hiding under the table with his best friend Austin Eubanks and another student named Jennifer Doyle. And Corey was shot in the neck, the chest, and the arm. And he died almost instantly from the one in the neck. 
On the day of his death, he had actually planned to go to the bank with his father to get a loan to put down the used car that he had wanted. And the reason why he was actually in the library that day was because he wanted to keep his grades up. And he was actually buried as an honorary Marine because he had a strong ambition to join the Marines. Now, another victim I want to talk about is the 11th victim of the shooting. Her name was Kelly Fleming. And she and her family were relatively new to the Littleton area. They moved to Littleton only 18 months before the shooting uh, on April 20th, 1999. She was said to have been a shy yet creative young girl and she loved Halloween and writing was a passion of hers, which I completely understand. I love writing books as well. That's why this one hit me so deep. She wrote songs, she wrote poems, she wrote short, short stories. And at one point she actually started an autobiography about her life. And she started all the way back from when her wa mother's water broke. And she got the whole way to the fifth grade before she passed away. Which is really impressive and admirable. And in April of 1999, she was in the process of learning how to drive. Along with having an ambition to buy a Mustang or Corvette to take her to her dream job of wanting to one day become a daycare provider. And because Kelly loved writing and she was often um, uh, talking about wanting to become a writer, she was often entering con writing contests. She, um, <clears throat> even though uh, Kelly was one of the shooting victims, her father actually stated he prayed for the families of Dylan and Eric, saying they'll have a tougher time getting over this than we will. Now we're going to talk about Lauren Townsend. Lauren Townsend was one of the final victims I'm going to talk about. So Lauren, not only was she a senior, but she was also captain of the varsity volleyball team. And her mother also coached that team. So Lauren, she was a member of the Columbine High School National Honor Society. And she was announced as valedictorian of the graduating class, which meant she had the highest grades in that class. The graduating class. And in fact, she had straight A's and was all straight A's and was a very intelligent young lady. Lauren was also a very talented sketch artist and could bring any type of ideas to life. When she wasn't studying to become an active or being an active part of school, she was volunteering at a local animal shelter and she was ecstatic about being accepted into Colorado State University to study biology. She was in the library studying when the shooting actually broke out and she had died from multiple wounds from her head, her chest, and her lower body. On her coffin, it had actually read, Lulu, you'll always be my baby. And that actually made me tear up when I read that. I'm not even gonna lie. Isaiah Scholes is one of the oldest victims of the massacre at 18, almost 19 years old. He would have been 19 on August 4th of... He was born on... Uh, he would have been 19 years old August 4th of 1999. Sorry. And Isaiah, he had a wonderful... He, he was a wonderful, fun-loving man with a wonderful personality. And in fact, it's said by his close friends and family that he wanted to be a professional comedian and that he was actually looking into an art college. Isaiah's parents stated that he had been born with a heart defect, but he refused to let that control his life. In fact, he had joined both the football team and the wrestling team, but he had quit the football team his junior year. And a theory that his father came up with was he possibly had quit due to racial intimidation. Because Isaiah wanted to go to an art college, he was actually looking at the Denver Institute of the Arts, and Isaiah was known to be a very popular young man. So much so that the 1999 principal stated that classmates would actually have arguments over who would work on projects with him. On the day of April 20th, 1999, Isaiah was actually in the library and he was studying to keep up his grades. In order to be an athlete in like any type of school, it's always important to have your grades as like A's, B's, occasional C's. You want to be passing all your classes. You could actually get kicked off of teams if you like don't have these good grades. So he was actually studying with Craig Scott and Craig Scott is Rachel Scott's brother. And another person, his name was Matt Ketcher. When the gunshot started to ring out, all three boys ran under the table to protect themselves. And it was actually claimed by Isaiah's parents and some other students that Isaiah actually had some personal issues with both Eric Harris and Dylan Claybold. Whenever the shooters saw Isaiah, they started commenting several racial slurs to him before trying to pull him out from underneath the table. When that didn't work, Eric just started opening fire on Isaiah and killed him instantly. 
Then after his death, Isaiah's parents claimed that the whole shooting was racially motivated, but he was the only black person that had been injured or killed. So that's kind of interesting. The last victim I'm going to be talking about today is Matthew Ketcher, and he was a 16-year-old sophomore who had recently turned 16 in February, two months prior to the shooting. And even though he had just turned 16, he was still a pretty huge guy. He was 210 pounds, and he was 6 feet tall. And because he was so big at 16, he actually played on both the offensive and defensive lines on the football team. And he was also a weightlifter to help keep him in shape for sports. He was also a very studious kid, and he was constantly in the library studying. And a close friend of his named uh, Greg ba Barnes, he stated that when he heard that Isaiah was... Uh, Matthew, sorry. Matthew was one of the people killed in the library. And he said it made sense because Matthew was always studying, and he was always trying to keep his... He put his academics first. And he had straight A's, but he never bragged about it. And, he, and Greg said that he always looked up to him for that. Sadly, Greg was actually so affected by Matthew's death, death that he ended up uh, committing suicide, which is absolutely heartbreaking to hear. And Matt, he was in the library with Craig Scott when the shooting broke out. And he was sitting next to Isaiah and was shot in the chest after Isaiah had been killed. So after Matt's death, the Columbine football team, they all wore uh, ribbons that said number 70 on it, which was Matt's number from his football jersey. Uh, the University of Colorado even sent Matt's younger brother, his name was Adam, a number 70 jer jersey in honor and memory of his brother Matt. So there's been a wonderful and supporting advocate of school massacres and that person is actually Sue Claybold and that is Dylan Claybold's mother and after April 20th 1999 Sue became an activist and an author she's trying to bring as much information to mental health as possible she wrote a book called A Mother's Reckoning Living in the Aftermath of Tragedy and her book instantly became a best-selling success and she actually committed herself to donating all the money that she made from that book to mental health charities and research and the suicide prevention hotline. Just a few years ago in 2017, uh, Sue had actually hosted a TED talk about Dylan's involvement in the 1999 shootings. And she mentioned the difference between suicidal feelings and thoughts versus homicidal feel feelings and thoughts. And I will actually be linking the video in the description box below in case you guys want to watch it. But please check it out. It's very informative and very interesting. And Sue Claybaugh, she claimed, she claimed that uh, when the shooting had occurred, she had refused to believe that Dylan was one of the shooters until she saw an interview of Andrew Solomon and she felt like she, her whole world was just crashing down. Because everything that she had refused to believe was true. And she didn't even know that Dylan had depression until a year later after the shooting. There's a survivor of Columbine. Her name is Anne Marie Hawkhalter, and she had been seriously wounded in the uh, shooting. And she stated that she actually received a letter from both Sue, which is Dylan's mom, and Eric uh, Harris's parents. And she said that the one from. S uh, the letter from Sue actually allowed her to feel more sympathetic and understanding towards Sue. She claimed that Sue's letter, letter was genuine and personal, while Eric's parents' letters felt like it was cold and robotic. In just this past July, Sue actually appeared in an episode of Storyville, where she and another uh, American, other American parents talked about their sons who had committed mass murders. And as usual at the end of my videos, I like to talk about my personal thoughts and feelings. So I just wanted to say all of my thoughts and prayers are with the families at this time. And that also includes Eric Harris's family and Dylan Claybold's family. And I think it's absolutely incredible what that Sue Claybold has done so much for the community to inform them about uh, her son, like what happened to her son, and being such an advocate for the families of the victims as well. So... As I say that, however, I do not want to take away from my feelings that so many lives were senselessly taken and they were murdered by Dylan and Eric. And 
the, even those who weren't even killed by them uh, like were affected by these deaths and that's why they committed suicide. So I would like you to please, as politely as you can, let me know what your thoughts are down below in the comment section in a respective manner. And mahalo for listening. I'll talk to you all in my next video. Goodbye.